morning. How's everybody this morning? Glad to have you with us this morning. Why don't you stand with us? You know, in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, the Pharisees are trying to trip Jesus up. And they say, hey dude, what is the greatest commandment? And his response is, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So I want to encourage you to do that with the way you worship this morning. And we're going to be reflecting on a lot of the things that He's done for us. And in spite of who we are, really. But we can be pure and saved and redeemed through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praises rising, eyes are turning to me. You turn to me. Oh, disturbing hearts are yearning for you. speak and if I was had my mask on y'all wouldn't be able to hear me uh, at all uh, but um, we are just trying to be cautious and y'all are doing a good job so remember continue to keep your hands clean continue to practice social distancing continue if you I just got a, a message a while ago somebody said hey some of us aren't feeling well doesn't mean they have COVID but it just means they're not feeling well we're taking precautions we're not gonna be there today I said perfect 
that's fine. You watch live on uh, on our on the Facebook, um, and you'll get you'll hear everything else everybody else hears. Uh, we also have the radio transmitter set up, and so if you ever feel like ah, I'm just not too sure about going into church today, all you have to do is pull out up right outside the building, and you'll be able to tune to 88.3, and you'll be able to hear everything that's going on inside the building. Um, so we're continuing to practice uh, social distancing and safe precautions, but we still want to operate and operate effectively as a church. We got BBS tonight, so I hope that you're excited about that. And so that kicks off tonight at six o'clock. Um, and so I know some of these kiddos are, man, they've been locked up in the house. They've been having the social distance. They've been doing all that kind of stuff. And they're like, Dad, I want to just hang out with some friends for a little bit. Well, that's VBS tonight, six o'clock. So whether your kids or your grandkids, if they haven't signed up yet, six o'clock tonight, bring them here, get them registered. Um, it'll be a great time. But I'm glad that we get to be here together. I'm glad that we get to worship together. We get to get into God's word together. Uh, and so before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Larry Shackelford, would you do me a favor? You can stand up right where you're at if you'd like, if you would open us up this morning in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise your name today, Lord, that you allow us to come together. Your word says let us come together and consider one another. Lord, we pray for your anointing upon this service. Bless every song, Lord. Bless every word that's presented today. Lord, give each one of us exactly what we need. In Jesus' name.
Sometimes we look and think, well, what's going to happen next? We know that you have gone before us. Lord, we thank you that you go before us, that you will never leave us. We know you will not forsake us, that you've called us redeemed. You've called us yours. And Lord, I pray as we get into your word that you have written for us to know you. Lord, I pray that today it reveals something new to us. I pray as we open it up and we get into a text that most of us are familiar with and can probably quote. Lord, I pray that through this you show us something new. But I pray, but most of all, that it shows who you are. And that if there's anybody here that doesn't know you and doesn't have that relationship with you, that today, today is that day of salvation for them. And I pray all of these things in the wonderful, the powerful name of Jesus. All right, well, if you have your Bible, turn into Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 is where we're going to be, and it is a familiar verse as we continue to go behind the text and look at some of our favorite verses throughout Scripture, and this would be one of mine. But when we get into this verse, and as we get into Philippians chapter 2, and you begin to sort of look at it and be like, oh, yeah, I know that verse. You know, one of the things that the Apostle Paul here is doing is he writes to the church in Philippi, as he begins to address this specific section of scripture, he begins to talk about attitudes. And I want you to understand today that attitude affects a lot. I don't know that if you've noticed that, even maybe in your own home or in your own family, maybe at, the, at your workplace or at school, attitude affects a lot. I try my best to always keep a positive attitude. That's just sort of... That's just sort of uh, who I am. And I, I try to tend to be on the optimistic side. In fact, somebody just last night 
and put on Facebook sort of, I don't know if y'all like these things, but I do, I just don't share them. But the, it was a, okay, you go and you select these colors, and by the colors that you select, it tells you sort of your outlook on things, your attitude about things. And so I, I get on there and, you know, okay, this one looks green, oh, this one's more orange, or this one's more, and my outlook on the way that this little test perceived by the colors I chose was I'm an optimistic person. And I would like to think I'm pretty optimistic. You ask my wife, I'm pretty, I always look at the positive thing. I always look at, okay, not how it's not going to work, how it can work. You know, I, I, I mean, immediately when this whole COVID-19 thing blew up, my attitude wasn't, oh, this is going to destroy the church. They're not going to let us meet. My whole attitude immediately from the beginning was, I can't wait till they let us come back because people are going to bum rush the church. They can't, they're not going to wait to get in the doors. That's because that's my attitude. I'm always trying to look at the positive. I'm always trying to look at, you know, how things, how God is going to use this. And, and sometimes our attitudes affect the people around us. You know, especially if they're negative attitudes or positive, but negative attitudes really affect the people around us. And they begin to bring people down. Sometimes it, you know, gives people a negative outlook, especially in church. So we get into Philippians chapter two. Understand that the church at Philippi, I believe, is, you know, sort of a the I guess you would call them the teacher's pet almost of the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul loved the, the church of Philippi. He had, he had a special place in his heart for him. You can see that as you start to read the very first chapter of the book of Philippians. How he loves the church of Philippi. How he is proud of them. How he's praying for them. And so as Paul is writing to them from prison, he is writing to them to try to encourage the church. And one of the things he's trying to encourage them to do is to keep a positive attitude. To keep a Christ-like positive attitude. And he begins to go on and he begins to tell them what that looks like. I think that as you begin to dig through chapter one and you realize that Paul is focusing and he's trying to give the church to understand how their attitude and the way that they look at things affects the church. You really begin to notice it when you get into chapter number two. And so in chapter number two, he begins to say, hey. Well, if you, you know, if you, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any love in you, if there's any joy at all, listen, listen to me what I'm about to tell you. This is the way that you want to live your life. This is the way you want to operate as a church. You are a body of believers. If you've got any part of Jesus within you whatsoever, this is how you want to be. And then he gets to verse five in Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, go to verse five, Philippians chapter two. Verse 5 is where we start. And the first thing in verse 5, it says, have this attitude in yourselves. He says, okay, here it is. You need to have this kind of attitude. Yet optimistic attitude is really good. Maybe a negative attitude is not so good. But the attitude that you really need to have, whether it's optimistic or pessimistic, whether it's glass half empty or glass half full, whatever your attitude is, Listen, this is the one you really need. And he says, so pay attention and have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying here is Jesus has given us the perfect example of attitude. If you want to talk about how your attitude is, if you want to look at yourself and begin to examine your attitude like each and every one of us should, this is what it should look like. In verse 6, who, although he existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Verse 7, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so the apostle Paul right there in those three verses right there, four verses, is telling people that, yeah, okay, it's great. The church is doing good. I need you to sort of watch out, though. Because if there's going to be one thing that's going to begin to well up in the church and begin to destroy some things and, you know, destroy your unity, it's the attitude that you have. 
And he says, so understand this. This is the attitude that Christ had. It was a, a humble attitude. I mean, he, he, he came from heaven and presented himself as a servant to the world that he's king over in order that he could reach us. We need to have this same attitude, he's telling us. This is the Jesus, he said. And for this reason, he said, this is the Jesus. He said, he was found in the appearance as a man, and he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Which, that's like an extra level of humility is what Paul was trying to point out to him. He went the extra mile to humble himself. Because he humbled himself even to the point of death, and not just any death, but the death of the cross. I mean, for people in Philippi, they understood what that meant because to them, the, the cross represented something that was brutal, that was horrific, and that Roman citizens weren't even allowed to be crucified on the cross because it was such an evil, horrific way for somebody to die. If you were a Roman citizen, you, you, you didn't have to be crucified no matter what your crime was. But Jesus humbled himself to the obedience of death and the death even on the cross. And then in verse 9, he says, For this reason also God highly exalted him, and he bestowed on him a name which is above every name. Which is above every name. And this is the scripture here that we all know. How many times have I even said this? That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those in heaven, those in earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love that scripture, and I can even remember preaching uh, and using that as a part of a sort of an end time series that I was preaching on using that specific text because it's really sort of a prophetic text. It's a text that is telling us that one day, because as we know right now in the world that we live in, not every knee bows and not every tongue confesses, but there will come a day that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Specifically, those in heaven, those on earth, and even those under the earth. Now, I don't want you to mistake this scripture because some people try to manipulate it as that this is some sort of universal salvation scripture. That everybody will at one point be saved because it says that everybody, whether they're in heaven, whether they're in earth, or whether they're under the earth, will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus. And that's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. What the Apostle Paul is saying is you will either bow your knee to him as king and savior, or you will bow your knee to him as judge and executioner. Because if you bow your knee to him as king and savior, you are going to live with him throughout eternity. But if you wait till that final judgment, when everyone will bow their knee, you will bow to him as a judge and an executioner, because in that moment, he will execute final justice as he executes you to an eternal hell. Everybody at some point will bow the knee. But as we look at this and we think about it, as he's writing to this church in Philippi, and we look at this one text and yes, it talks about that end time. Yes, it is a prophetic scripture, I believe. But what is he actually saying? As he introduces this into, the, in, into this conversation, and a lot of people consider this, they believe the way that the Apostle Paul wrote this portion of scripture it's almost written out like a musical hymn. And it's possible people believe that this was sang as a hymn, as one of the songs in the first church. And he wrote this out, and he wrote, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess, the, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do we learn from this? When we look at this text, well, one of the things I believe Paul is pointing out to them that they had to understand was the deity of Jesus, his deity, meaning that he is the one true son of God. Now, here's what I want you to do this morning. 
as you have your Bibles and you put your thumb or your finger right there in Philippians chapter 2 and you sort of keep it read, I also want you to go over to the Gospel of John because we're sort of going to go back and forth from the Gospel of John to Philippians chapter 2. You're going to want to go toward the end of the Gospel of John, right around verse or chapter 19. So go ahead and, and mark your place there. If you're one of those people that have the Bible app or the FBC map, I mean, you're not going to have to put any fingers anywhere because you're going to be able to follow right along where I'm going. So right now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, what does this text teach us? As Paul is pouring this out to the church here at Philippi, the first thing that we look at in verse 10 is this. We look at the proclamation of his deity. His deity he is the Son of God. He is God. So in verse 10 it says, So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So I want you to realize something. This scripture, this specific text right here, is actually sort of a hybrid. Y'all know what a hybrid is? A hybrid is something that's sort of been mixed together uh, to create something. They take two things and mix it together. What Paul did to show the deity of Jesus is he made a hybrid and took Jesus Christ, the name Jesus, the Messiah, and put him into Isaiah 45, 23. Paul, you only find this specific verse quoted really two times. Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 14, and then the Lord himself quotes it in Isaiah chapter 45, 23. Isaiah 45, 23 says, the Lord says, I have spoken by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. And so Isaiah, the Lord comes out and proclaims this exact thing that Paul is talking about in Philippians chapter 2. Same thing in Romans chapter 14 and verse 11. Paul quotes it and says, For it is written, I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So when Paul comes back, and says the hybrid of it, and he interjects Jesus Christ into it, what he's saying is you need to understand that God was speaking of himself in Isaiah chapter 45. And God is Jesus. Jesus is God. They are three in one. This, they, are, they are triunion. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are all Yahweh. They are all Jehovah. They are all God. And so he interjects the name of Jesus to say, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and those who are in earth and those who are under the earth. And so he is proclaiming his deity as the son of God, that he is God. Now pay attention in John chapter 19. See, when I look at this and why it's important is you come out of that scripture that talks about the humility of the cross and what Jesus endured as he humbled himself, as that obedient servant, that he left his throne in heaven and he came here. What we see is a contradiction when he's getting ready to go to the cross. We see that humiliation that he goes through. We see the experience. So it's important as Paul is pushing the deity, they would be reminded, they had heard the stories that were written in John chapter 19, as John's account says it, and then Pilate took Jesus in verse 1, and scorched him. So now I want you to mentally begin to picture everything that the Son of God, God himself in the flesh, is enduring. You would think that a God, the God, the one and only God, would never have to endure the things that he is about to go through. But Pilate took him, Jesus, he scorched him in verse 1. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. So the mocking begins. They, 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 they begin to twist who he is. And they twist the crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him to mock that he thinks he's a king. He thinks that he's something special. In verse 3, 
And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews. He's humbled himself. Despite the fact that he is God, he humbled himself. And he put himself through this. This humiliation on, on our behalf. And it says, they began to come up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And to give him slaps in the face. I mean, could you imagine what would happen if somebody would have walked up in that day, in, that, in the day that we're talking about, that Jesus is before Pilate with the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Could you imagine if somehow somebody just accidentally made their way to the throne of Caesar and slapped him in the face? What would have happened? God forbid, right? I mean, it would have been horrific. The torment that that individual would have been put through. They may have not been put to death. They may have been put through a life of just straight torture for offending the king in that way. But yet here's the son of God being slapped in the face, being mocked, it says in verse 3. And then in verse 4, and Pilate came out again and he said to him, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Pilate's struggling here because he's got Jesus in front of him. And though Jesus is being mistreated, though Jesus is being slapped and spit on and mocked, Pilate still can't find that he's guilty of anything. And so he goes and he presents Jesus to his people. He presents Jesus to his, his hometown folk. He takes him and presents him and says, Behold, I bring him out to you so that you may know I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing this crown of thorns and a purple robe. And so now he is being marched out in front of his people, being mocked. And they see this. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And so when the chief priest and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law. And by the law, we, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe who he was. But Paul is pointing out the deity. He is the son of God. He is God himself. Not only does it point out his deity, but it points out his authority, which I believe is very, very important as the church Though this church, I believe, was operating well. I believe as Paul is trying to address their attitudes, it's more of, hey, let's clean a little house here. It's not necessarily, hey, you guys are doing horrible. Change your attitudes. It's more of like, hey, this is what you need to watch out for. As things continue to progress, as the church continues to grow, as leadership continues to grow and power is given out and authority in the church is given out to individuals, you need to be careful because it's the attitudes that are going to kill you. You all need to stay humble. He even talks about, you know, I think in chapter or verse three in chapter two, he even talks about, you know, not just humbling yourself, but, you know, hey, you don't want to put yourself above other people. Look at the way that you conduct yourself. Don't put yourself above other people. So it all becomes about this attitude, but they're also at this time, you still have to realize they're, they're, there's strong persecution coming after them. This isn't easy. They, what they're going through, what they're experiencing. Paul is writing to them from prison. He, he is in shackles and he's writing to them from, from in prison and he doesn't even have a problem with it. If you go back and you start to read chapter one, he doesn't even have a problem. He said, this is going to work out for the glory of God and for the gospel. This is all good. Don't you worry about me. I'm worried about you. You need to have the right attitude. This is going to work out. Why? Because he understood the authority. He understood the authority of Jesus. 
that Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And he understood Jesus's authority. And so when, when, when he quotes that scripture from Isaiah 45, he interjects Jesus's name. And when he says, you know, it is at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow, whether it be in heaven, whether it be on earth or whether it be under the earth, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't no matter where you're coming from, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what's, what's important about that is that when you think about going before a throne, we bow in respect, but we confess with our mouth our allegiance. And so he is saying that when, when you, when every tongue confesses, you are, you are vowing your allegiance to the one and only King of Kings, you are showing his authority that whatever you ask for, my King, I will do. Whatever you ask for, whatever you want, whatever you need, my King, I will do. I bow before you in respect because I understand your position and your deity. And I confess with my mouth that you are the one and only Son of God. I've given my life to you because I'm under your authority. And Paul realized in that cell, he's under the authority of Jesus. Jesus will take care of it. He will take care of it. When you backflip and you go and you, you, you start to look again and you think about how he humbled himself and how he went to the cross. Listen to this interaction that he has with Pilate. When you think about the authority of Jesus and why it's important as he went from the humility and how he humbled himself to now he is highlighting the authority of Jesus. He says this, look at, look at what it says in John chapter 19, go now verse eight. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, remember that was the statement that the, the, the high priest, and they said, ah, he's already claimed himself son of God, kill him, crucify, crucify. Therefore, when Pilate had heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Pilate's wanting nothing to do with this. He's wanting nothing to do with it. And he entered into the praetorium again and he said to Jesus where are you from where, where are you from oh Jesus of Nazareth <laughs> you know I, was like, I mean where you were from the, your name it just sort of followed you everywhere but that wasn't he wasn't wanting to know that he was from Nazareth he's wanting to know what kingdom are you a part of what kingdom where are you from but Jesus gave him no answer so Pilate said to him you don't speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority? You hear what Pilate saying now? Who, who, whose authority does he have? Well, yeah, he's got a little Roman authority as he's talking to the Son of God. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you? I have the authority to crucify you. And Jesus now answers. Listen to his answer. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And so, man, they're really putting Pilate in the spot now because they're challenging Pilate's authority. They're challenging Jesus's authority. And verse 13 says, therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out. He set him down on the judgment seat at the place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha, and now it was that that day of preparation was for the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they said to him, and he said, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Wow. They recognized no authority that Jesus had in that moment. And Jesus made it quite clear to Pilate that I have all the authority. And even the authority that you think you have right now, 
to go ahead and to crucify me and to judge me. It's only because I'm letting you have it. And Paul was pointing out to that Philippian church the authority of Jesus, that he is Jesus Christ. He is Lord. I heard as I was studying, I was getting ready for this, I heard a, I heard a guy that was talking about this specific text, and he was talking about that word Lord. I love to, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm leading somebody to Christ, I think it's very important that that word is explained to them. And I heard this guy explain it in a different way. But usually I will sit somebody down and I'll ask them, well, what is a Lord to you? you know, and and you, you have different answers. It depends on really, honestly, what generation they come from. A, a little bit of a younger generation always talk, a lot of times talks about like Lord of the Rings. Like, okay, what is a Lord though? It's somebody with authority that is over you. One of, my, one of the examples I like to use is, I say, you think about this, you think about a land lord. You have a land lord. You're renting a property from somebody. You don't own it. You're paying rent so that you can occupy it, but you don't own it. You live there, you pay rent, you occupy that land, but you have a landlord. And what does that landlord do? He makes all of the rules and regulate you. You can either bring pets in or you can't bring pets in. You can either have kids or you can't have kids. You can do this or you can do that. You can have people over, but they can't stay the night. That's what a landlord says. And then they make you sign a lease agreement that you agree to follow all of their instructions. And when you sign that, you're saying, I am yielding to your authority as the owner of this property. And so whenever I, I'm explaining to somebody and I go over to Romans chapter 10 and I'm explaining to them that, hey, with, you, with your mouth, you confess unto salvation and with the heart you believe unto righteousness, that you make Jesus Christ your Lord, it talks about, and your Savior. You make him your Lord. You confess him as your Lord. Here it's talking about confessing him as Lord. Well, what does that mean? It means you are giving him all authority over your life. You're no longer living for yourself. You're no longer doing that. I, I, I'm a free will guy. All right? I believe in free will. But I also believe that once you become a believer, you give up that free will because you say, I'm taking on the will of the Father. Yes, we have free will to choose. God gives that to us. But once we say, I'm following you, you say, I am following you. I'm giving up my will. I am humbling myself because I'm worth nothing. And I am following you because you are everything. And so when it talks about that, Jesus Christ, that they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They are confessing that he is over all. So when I go back to that, I talk about the, the, the speaker that I heard talking about this. He gave this example, and he's a way smarter guy than I. That's why I was listening to what he had to say. But he talks about that when, the, he talks about that when you get into this specific text, really, and you get back into the old text, where they would have been reading in the Old Testament, like if they would have went back to Isaiah 45, in their text, it wouldn't have been in Hebrew. In this day, most likely it was in Greek. And it, would have, it was called the Septuagint. And so they would read in the Septuagint. And when they would see that word Lord, it would be kairos. That's what it would mean. But when, you, when it would translate over from the Old Testament... It would translate over. That's what would transfer over as Yahweh, Jehovah, the one and only God, the great I am. So understand that when Paul is saying here that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ isn't just like a landlord, but it is that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. He is Jehovah. He is the great I am. He is the one. That is him. And he has all the authority in the world. Right now, he's got me in prison. But just like he did before, Paul could have said, he can break these chains at any point because he has that authority. And as we close, the last thing was his purpose. And when you look at this, that they bow, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to what? To the glory of God the Father. Because it's all about glorifying God bringing him glory, bringing, bringing people to the knowledge of who God is and that he wants to have a relationship with them and the extravagant measures that he has gone to to do that. This is like an unveiling. When, when you look at Philippians 2 
I mean, Philippians 2, 10, 11, it's like an unveiling of, yes, you had this humble servant that left heaven, that came to this earth, that died on the cross, even the death of the cross. But this is who he is. This is the God of all creation. This is the God of the universe. That he left his throne to come here for you so that he can have a relationship with you. Ultimately, that he is glorified and that you know who he is. And so when, we, when you look at that, it says, to the glory of God the Father, it is unveiled that this is about a relationship that you get to have with the Heavenly Father. And go back to John chapter 17. We sort of backtrack. And this is Jesus getting ready. This is right before Judas shows up with that holy kiss that ends up betraying Jesus and he's drug off and then he ends up before Pilate. You find Jesus. This is the, what we call the, the highly priest prayer. And he finds himself. And listen to what Jesus prays. And Jesus spoke these things. And he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. What hour was that? That was the hour of the cross. The hour has come, Father. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you have given him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you gave him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one, only, true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given for me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And Jesus is saying right there in that moment, in that last prayer, that this is all about the glory of the Father. And the greatest glory is people being brought to him. That's what it was about. People being brought to God, being reconciled to God through Jesus. I'm going to ask our band to come back up as we prepare for that last song. But the question I have for you today as you get into this text and you really look at it is, do you know this Jesus? The true Son of God, who in, who in all humility came from heaven, Gave his life upon the cross so that you could have life. Do you know this Jesus? The one who is the one and only Son of God. The one whose deity was proven at the resurrection. Do you know this man, Jesus, who has all authority? He told his disciples in Matthew chapter 28 as he's getting ready to send it out. I have all authority over heaven and earth. It has been given to me. Why? Because I am Jesus Christ, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the great I am. That is me. And he says, and I want a relationship with you. And it's all about glorifying the Father and bringing people to me. Maybe you look at this today and you say, Pastor, I know him. I know that Jesus. Let me ask you this. When's the last time that you have bowed down before your holy king and confessed to him your allegiance? That today, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Because of who you are. Because of what you've done. See, I think sometimes we, we make that first step and then we forget. We move on about our life. But this isn't something you move past. This is the great I am we're talking about. Maybe today you just need to evaluate yourself and just say, maybe it's time again, God, that I just bow before you, realizing who you are. Realizing that you deserve every ounce of praise I can give. Not my will, but yours. But maybe you're here and you've never really taken that step of faith. Maybe you've never really understood who Jesus really is and what he's done for you. Maybe you say today, I want to know more. 
not just more, but I want to know him. And if that is you, we don't want you to leave here today without knowing him. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray right now that through this word, through this word that Paul gives us, Lord, that you will open our eyes, that you will unveil yourself to us in all of your glory, in your deity, in your authority, God, your purpose in our life. May it be revealed to us today. And in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing with us?